On today's World Insight, trouble with the global supply of semiconductor chips. Can a White House CEO summit help fix it? Is geopolitics a part of the problem? And an eye for the extraordinary in the mundane captured on camera, but hidden in her time. Now, discover the genius of Vivian Meyer's body of photographic work. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. A global semiconductor shortage has roiled the automotive and high-tech sectors. That, at least, is according to the U.S. business community. On Monday, White House officials met with top executives from nearly 20 major companies, many of whom have urged their governments to help. Earlier, a U.S. auto industry group warned that the shortage could result in 1.28 million fewer vehicles built this year and disruptions in production for another six months. So how dangerous is the global shortage of semiconductor chips? What are the reasons behind it? Will this shortage have a chain reaction into more businesses around the world? And where is China and the U.S. on their own path towards seeking self-sufficiency, quote-unquote, in chips? Let's loop in our panelists from both countries. For the U.S. Semiconductor Summit and results related to it in Boston, we have Roger Entner, founder and lead analyst at Recon Analytics. And in Washington, D.C., Ernest McDuffie, founder of the Global McDuffie Group. In Beijing, Jay Huang, founder partner of J Stone Capital and former managing director of Intel China. I want to start by asking you, uh, Mr. Antoner, uh, what is the purpose of the Semiconductor Summit? Is it really being achieved given the results so far? Well, the Semiconductor uh, Summit in uh, Washington, D.C. was largely there for the industry to um, voice uh, its concerns and to uh, get the American administration to uh, spend and uh, focus on the uh, semiconductor uh, shortage that we currently have in the United States. So mm -hmm. everybody was able to voice their uh, grievances and uh, uh, ask for subsidies. Uh, Mr. McDuffie, uh, what are these grievances? I think some of the uh, grievances, particularly the automobile industry, uh, was that they, they weren't just, they had to cancel about a million plus uh, cars and then they, they just don't have uh, the supply uh, to meet the demand that they need there. So they're worried about shutting down uh, plants and losing uh, revenue from uh, the sales because of the shortages. Mr. Huang, are we seeing both China and the United States are having industrial policies toward semiconductor now? The semiconductor, um, Previously, it was not a Wall Street starting in the, in the United States. And then co recent couple of years, and they got a lot more attention. Now, one of the things is the U.S., for example, years ago, 37% of semiconductor being produced there. Now it's about 12%. Now, Washington look at it as a danger. Is it? Uh, I, I think we'll have to think about the two things. Uh, if you look at the semiconductor company's revenue, I think a U.S. corporation take about 50% market share. They're absolutely world number one. However, you look at where the semiconductor chips get manufactured, your number is right. Only 14% is in the United States because most of them are manufactured in and outside the United States, particularly in Taiwan. So that's uh, generate some concerns in the United States mm -hmm. now and. Uh, Almost every country, uh, like United States, Japan, Europe, and China, also want to manufacture uh, factories and located in their home country. That's the new trend. Very interesting. Mr. McDuffie, what's likely to be the economics behind this, or this is more political rather than economics? Well, I, I think it's both. The, uh, certainly the 
the academic, there's huge multi-billion dollar uh, industries involved, electric vehicles, uh, uh, every electric device from cell phones to the computers. So the, the bottleneck that worries me, that concerns me uh, more so uh, than just the, just the uh, isolated activity of, of uh, manufacturing the semiconductors themselves are the raw materials, which are really uh, only being produced in a, in a couple of places globally. I understand that there's a plant in Canada, uh, Saskatchewan, that's uh, planning to go online in 2022. That'll be the, I think, one of the first uh, uh, plants that'll be doing um, processing of these raw materials on demand uh, outside of uh, China and one other plant in the United States. Are we going to see the division of supply chains from now on uh, regarding semiconductor, both materials and almost every important step of the way? What does that mean for China? Um, I uh, obviously, I think China has a lot of factory being built here. Yeah. I think that this is a new trend. But if you look back at 20 years ago, and 20 years ago, there were, there were lots of factories in everywhere, and in Europe, in Singapore. Mm. And uh, you know, after a while, they found that it, it does not, uh, they didn't make economic sense. So lots of factories and one bankruptcy. Uh, I will not be surprised if 10 years from now, you found a lot of the newly established factory going bankrupt from investors point of view it probably matters yeah. uh, from politicians probably it doesn't matter and then right now the major concern is uh, so-called national security not the economic and uh, uh, you know um, sense mm. uh, i think we're seeing the political tensions uh, continuing and with that you know, you pay a price, right? The lowest cost provider uh, philosophy that we uh, had for the last 20 to 30 years uh, is taking a backseat. And what it means is that prices will rise or will be higher than they could otherwise uh, would be. But there are a lot of details uh, from raw materials to how to produce, yes. to the talents, to the uh, transportation, to the standards, to the security, a lot of things, and eventually the price. What does that mean? Well, it took 20 to 30 years to build the supply chain that we have yes. built now. That works really, really well. And this can't be undone overnight. You know, it, it's, uh, this will take years uh, to change. And so the first steps are being placed now. It doesn't mean that uh, the supply chain will will uh, will fray and and become diversified. You know, prices will rise, innovation will slow down, the yields of the semiconductors will will go down as well. Mr. Huang, now with both countries and many others also trying to put industrial policies behind semiconductor sector, uh, what does it mean for China to proceed further on that road? Uh, I think, uh, uh, interestingly, um, this uh, sanction or trade war between uh, U.S. and China so far and uh, seems to stimulate a lot of uh, new opportunities and in China for the semiconductor startup companies. Um, previously, they can only come into the consumer electronic domain. Now, because everybody and, uh, are worried about and their supply overseas may get cut, cut. So they all want to have a domestic and alternatives and also new semiconductor companies, the startups, suddenly found that they can sell their product not only in the consumer electronic domain, but also in, in the industrial domain and also in the automobile domain. So that is a new opportunity for China's uh, new startup semiconductor companies, Thailand, and also the, um, the core technologies. Uh, which are China's uh, really need, and and uh, that's a something a challenge for China's semiconductor and industry, and we can see and the China semiconductor on the design side and will be much less rely on imports. That's for sure, mm. and also and this design China designed um, and the chips can supply to the world and hopefully 
which were going to reduce the, the price and to the consumers. We're at the beginning of a, of a long uh, journey. Uh, one of the uh, big challenges uh, basically around the globe is that a lot of the basic um, uh, intellectual property uh, is American in intellectual property. Uh, x86 processors made by Intel, AMD, and, and, and VIA are the foundation on which a lot of uh, our PC and, and uh, data centers are being built. Uh, ARM technology that basically builds and drives all of our cell phones. To be truly independent, uh, other countries would have to uh, replicate uh, the same groundbreaking, different uh, intellectual uh, property and, and, and way how this works. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're simply building a factory that is still reliant on American uh, inventions. To a certain degree, yes, and I agree um, with Roger says, um, but we also need to look into the future. Um, for example, um, x86 and its architecture primarily used in the PC and the server uh, side. But then in the smartphone, it do not dominate. I couldn't even penetrate and into the smartphone. We got the ARM architecture. Now they have a new uh, architecture called a RISC-V, which is open source, which does not have a any country associated with that, uh, people think that uh, risk of five could be the new architecture for an uh, IOT, the Internet of Things, for example. I, I think this IP issue um, may not be a showstopper as we move along. Very interesting. Uh, Mr. McDuffie, your take. Tensions and problems that still exist on the political realm, human rights realm, and, and national security realm. There's a lot of issues between the two countries that aren't resolved, but I think we can work, the two countries can work together on resolving those issues at the same time as they normalize, um, you know, the trade agreements between them. One of the issues, Mr. Antoner, is for the United States to specifically understand and define what is national security within its own national debate. This administration has not figured that out. Uh, do you see signs that they might figure it out? Uh, in what direction? What is likely to be? We can look back not only over the last four years, but also the Obama and uh, George W. Bush administration. Mm -hmm. And the, the red thread that goes through these administrations is a basic mistrust of, of China. I would expect that we will see some level of trade restrictions uh, between the U.S. and China to continue uh, in the foreseeable future. And uh, that would create a lot more uncertainty uh, because, you know, as Jay mentioned, uh, a, a significant part of the uh, semiconductor manufacturing is being done in China and any disruption there would be uh, crippling for the for basically the world economy that relies on uh, on on chipsets. Mm. There's the basic mistrust that uh, and and the charges that both countries are spying against each other, and uh, the American uh, administration doesn't want to make it easier for uh, the. For, for China to spy on the United States based on uh, supercomputer technology, uh, their grievances around, uh, around human rights, and uh, that puts a lot of obstacles up, uh, you know, that would prevent normalization of the trade relations. Mr. Huang, what, do you, what is your understanding of the interpretation of so-called national security? If we look back in history, in the 80s, the, the wars and the semiconductor trade war between United States and the Japan, mm -hmm. at that time, government is still national security. It's not China versus U.S., it's the U.S. versus Japan. At that time, because of the Japan took up the memory chip 
and the market share from the United States, primarily from Intel. And then the, the results of that trade war, and then, you know, Japan has to cut back their memory chip uh, supply. The interesting part of that is, and after that, there is a no U.S. semiconductor company are doing a memory chip despite of this trade war. And then they, they think they have a better opportunity, make more money into CPU, for example. So that is interesting and the lesson and look like if you look back on that trade war, I look at who are the winners. Actually, U.S. is not necessarily the winner because after that, none of the U.S. company were making a memory chip anymore. And in Japan, they do not um, do the memory chip anymore, but they move up the supply chain into the semiconductor and equipment side and actually quite successful. The true beneficiary of that trade war is actually is Korea company. They pick up the, all the memory chips. If I look back history, they always have this unexpected consequences. Yeah. Very true. Given this nature of the semiconductor summit, it's very much about how much the government will support it and how much money out of the new package will be put here. So the question really is how much will be needed? Uh, whether the government's role will be a successful role in both circumstances, very different circumstances, I would argue, in U.S. and China. So let's have Mr. McDuffie come in here. When you look back at history and you try to project into the future, the things that really change history uh, are the things that are unpredictable. And so going into the future, it's going to be the same, something unpredictable. Well, when you look at the big picture, when we we're talking specifically about the semiconductor industry, and you try to look at it in the largest macro sense that you can right now, nobody's got their arms around it. I don't think any country has a really solid feel mm -hmm. for the interdependency and the complexity of that system. And until somebody gets their arms around it, and it, it, may, it might be an independent think tank somewhere and not a company that actually does the uh, research and the study mm -hmm. to put the, uh, the facts on the table of what, what entity actually affects what <laughs> and how can you really make real policy yeah. that has real effect that you think it's going to have unless you can model the system somehow. Right. And it, let, there's, there's really not anybody doing that. Let, let me ask uh, Mr. Anderner the same question. You know, what about that? Uh, what is going to be the government's role eventually in this, uh, obviously, industrial policy age, in a way, uh, uh, concerning semiconductor? Uh, do you think that would be a successful one, Mr. Anderner? Well, imita as people say, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. And the current uh, American administration has certainly looked towards China as a success model with its uh, strong influence on the uh, economy. And it's modeling its current infrastructure program a lot on what has worked in China. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how much money is enough? And then, exactly. uh, you know, the hallmark of Chinese industrial policy is uh, a, a really a truly long-term perspective. Mm. Here in the United States, it's with every election, you could have a different outcome, right? Yes. And so that will dictate the, uh, the success of it because the big benefit of, uh, that China has, it's, it, it is very good in long-term planning. And the U.S. Uh, political system doesn't necessarily lend itself to that. And so the success is really, will the U.S. stick with it, or is this a four-year fluke, basically? That well, they were arguing, the you know, Mr. Antoner, what about the moonshot? You know, what about the, uh, you know, the gene sequencing? Uh, what about uh, a lot of things that's happening in the U.S. history in terms of innovation? It's all behind, behind it. It's all, you know, industrial policy in a way, the national... Yes. Uh, the government, federal level, are putting a lot of money and efforts into it. Uh, let's just make one thing happen. I, I agree with you completely. But what we have seen, for example, with the moonshot was that successive American administrations, regardless of, uh, of party, agreed on the same vision and kept pulling at the same end of the Very road. True. 
uh, with the divisions in American uh, society, this agreement on the basic vision going forward is, is less firm than it has ever been. And that is really impacting uh, this term, type of long-term planning that requires you to look ahead more than eight years yeah. of, of two presidential terms, yeah. but of, of 10, 12, 20 years. And that consensus is more elusive than ever in the United States. Let's just come back to China side. Mr. Huang, my question, last question for you as well. How successful will this industrial policy be? Uh, the other two gentlemen from the U.S. side have been asking that because that's likely also to have a, an impact on the you know, policy direction in the U.S. Uh, has China's experience been demonstrating that this time it will also be a great success? Do we know? I think that, uh, currently there were a lot of money, I mm -hmm. mean a lot of money poured into semiconductor industry in China government and the private sectors as well. Mm -hmm. it, it's a uh, lot of money. Uh, with so much money in such a short time period, the people started to wondering whether there is a bubble. Mm -hmm. But as we say, when water goes down, we will know who are swimming naked. But <laughs> before the water goes down, it's probably premature to say who are actually swim uh, naked, uh -huh. especially from people who never swim nakedly. <laughs> I see every one of you gentlemen are becoming so humorous and philosophical when we talk about this very important issue. But probably that's the best choice you could make because there are so many uncertainties. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, Roger Etner, Ernest McDuffie, J. Huang, really appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. You're watching World Inside, still to come. An eye for the extraordinary in the mundane captured on camera, but hidden in her time. Now, discover the genius of Vivian Meyer's body of photographic work. Up next. Welcome back. This is World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. One of the most interesting stories to unfold in photography is probably the remarkable work of Vivian Meyer. The nanny turned photographer left an incredible amount of eye-catching images, shocking even professional photographers. Vivian was born in 1926 and she worked for a four decades as a nanny, but in private, she enjoyed being a street photographer. Now, a new exhibition at Today Art Museum in Beijing seeks to take visitors from China also on a journey into the lonely, mysterious world of the legendary Vivian Meyer and the rich spiritual world from the 1950s to the 1980s captured by her lens. Earlier, I talked to Jesse Zhang and Anne Mohan, who is a curator of this exhibition, A Hidden Genius, Vivian Meyer. Let's listen to our conversation. It was fun. And I'm joined by Jessica Jiang, director of the Today Art Museum and co-curator of the hidden genius, Vivian Meyer, and Anne Mohan, who is the director of a D-Chroma Photography and also co-curator of a hidden genius, Vivian Meyer. What a show, in a way, of a, a woman who can achieve so much uh, without, you know, being the big name of her generation. Tell me more, Anna, about this exhibition. What makes her, Vivian Meyer, such a legend? Well, you know, um, this case is a very specific case in history of photography. There's no other. And um, this show at today's Art Museum is the first show in China we present uh, with a specific part of her archive, which is the self-portrait. I mean, it's the best show probably we ever had about the self-portrait. And the case is specific because it gathers three aspects. First, we have a huge archive of 100,020 um, pictures, which mm -hmm. is a huge part of her archive. Second thing, it's the mystery of, of Vivian Meyer. I mean, yeah. Vivian Meyer is, is still... Yeah. Um, um, I mean, surrounded by something really mysterious that makes 
a case really at attractive. And third Absolutely. thing is that all her archive uh, was destined to, to disappear. So uh -huh. the discovery is also something really special. What about to you, Jessica? You showed me around earlier in the exhibition. I'm sure beyond that, you have something to say why she's such a legend, even to many Chinese viewers. Yes. So besides she being such an extraordinary photographer, um, there is such a variety of reasons that makes her really an icon of street photographer of that era. Um, first of all, she's a nanny. So she's this um, working class, pretty much invisible or ignored in the society at the time. And she took over, like Anne said, over 100,000 um, negatives, but only 5% of them, um, roughly, are printed by herself. And also she's, you know, a self-taught mm. photographer, a uh, female photographer at the time, which is very rare. And um, the way um, people discover her work is uh, quite a story itself that how they discovered her work um, after she passing away exactly. through the uh, warehouse auction sales. So, and also of course the controversy about, you know, the um, intellectual property rights of her works and there's so many puzzles and mm. I think making all of these parts making the whole story a mystery mm. and um, that's why we named the show A Hidden G Genius, yes, Vivian indeed. Meyer. You know, one of the things is that why she is being, you know, she's being such a silent name and yet be able to being so talented of her generation and capture so much dramatic moments of history in a way. Yes, you know, <clears throat> what is fascinating in all that story is that, well, she was no one. She was uh, someone who took part of the invisibles, as Jessica said, and she took part of the black face of the reverse of the American dream. Mm. And um, at that time, the American dream was about to, um, to disappear. I mean, all that people, the richness, wellness, all that beautiful white uh, smiles, um, <laughs> representing something that Vivian did not took part of. Yes. And finally, I think she, she really uh, documented uh, that times. The, other temporality of the society and it's um, behind her you know there's a lot of people that could be uh, Vivian Meyer because suddenly in history of, of photography we mm. have an amateur we had other cases like uh, Jacques-Henri uh, Lartigue for example who was yeah. ki kind of amateur but she demonstrate us that um, there's other kind of photographers that could fit in history of, photograph of mm -hmm. photography. And that's really fascinating. And she was a nanny, and she was a woman, and she was an immigrant, right. and she was no one. And all her work, and specifically uh, this exhibition at today's art museum about a self-portrait is a question of identity, identity right. of women in the 60s in US. Back in the 1960s in, in the West, uh, there was a, a, such a generation, the beat generation in a way, uh, how they see the world and how they've been treated by the world and how they've been changing the world. And Vivian uh, Meyer, who captured that moment with you know, so many different characters and different moments, help us to understand it better. But it also makes us think about today, uh, Anna. You know, we are at another very interesting and dramatic juncture. A lot of things could change in this direction or that direction. It, it's so much like what she experienced of her generation in a way, Anna. Uh, I think the work of Vivian announced a radical change in our society that appears right now with the digital <coughs> era. Um, the specific part of the, the work of Viviane is about self-representation. Mm. Since 20 years, since uh, the mobile phone appears, um, <clears throat> we are the witness of a phenomenon that is really, I mean, on my side, it, it's worrying because um, it seems like people need, through self-representation, selfies, self-portraits, um, to find the proof that they exist 
and that they are alive. Mm. In the case of Vivian, uh, the necessity to represent herself was in a way to declare that she was there at that time when she took each picture. But now, um, in our society, young people um, have an excess of self-representation. And for me, that means there's a crisis of identity mm. in, our, in our world right now. That's a very interesting way of looking at it. Jessica, I know you saw a lot of Chinese viewers going to the exhibition. Tell me more about how is her generation, you know, in the United States could echo with this current generation of Chinese who certainly is experiencing quite some dramatic changes in the world. Um, she was born in 1926, so she's, you know, in the 20s, she's born right before the Great Depression, and uh, she's witnessed pretty much um, the Second World War, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, mm -hmm. the Cold War, and uh, September 11, um, and also all these um, technical um, technology innovation and uh, advancements. Mm -hmm. So she, and also she's uh, 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 really cares about news and she's a hoarder of newspapers, as you can see <laughs> from her documentary. That's right. <laughs> she also has a strong local, you know, social like opinion. Um, and she even questioned people in her documentary, like, oh, why don't you have a political opinion? Yeah. You should have opinion. She's quite a, you know, rare, this lady, such an independent lady from, you know, how we see um, women now, but so, so rare in her time. Yeah. So I, I think really through her work, you can be a kind of chronicle, but also sometimes random um, depiction of a typical working class um, during her time. Photography um, in China is, um, is quite niche. So this time we brought Vivian Myers show for the first time in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're really um, surprised and, and happy to see such a big crowd and so many interests. Vivian Meyer, according to both the documentary and some of the oral history recounts, are a lone wolf in a way. <laughs> she enjoys solitude. Um, we do not know much about her, that's why. Uh, so, uh, Jessica, um, you know, mm -hmm. China was quite a traditional society for women. Of course, uh, since the new China was founded in 1949, things have changed much from feudal society jumping into a modern society. But now people have also been talking about how much progress have we been making uh, for women particularly. Jessica, I know you, uh, you know, a young woman from China, you studied in the U.S., and now you're coming back and working in the art. But I'm sure you have some thoughts about this, you know, women being, quote unquote, alone or enjoy the space of solitude in a society um, that is still moving and evolving. What is it like, uh, you know, Vivian Meyer today for the Chinese women in a way? Yeah, I, I find her very inspiring, um, not just to artists and photographers, but to all of us, um, women or, you know, anyone in mm -hmm. the society. Because I think um, she's, you know, she's been single, uh, like Anne said, throughout her life. She never had children or family, um, and she not, never even had any friends. But um, she just really dedicated her whole life to photography. And that really makes her so, so extraordinary and fascinating for us and so inspirational. And I think um, even though she was um, single, um, I don't think she is lonely. Mm. Um, I think she's really, um, and like Anne said earlier, she really enjoys creating works and t taking photos, and that's her passion and mm -hmm. and what she pursued for all her life and wholeheartedly. And she just spent such a great deal of time to pursue her passion and. And I, I think in a way that she's living maybe even a fuller life than a lot of people who are, you know, sometimes, you know, in each area, there are people who are lost and confused. And, yeah. But um, maybe Maya really knows who she was and uh, what she wants to do. And she did it and really um, used um, 
putting all her time and energy yeah. towards it. So I, I really envy her. <laughs> yeah, she, she's having a very rich life, shall we put it that way. Uh, she has a very different world, you know, uh, her own world in a way that we can finally share. Mm -hmm. You know, Vivian Meyer, to many, is an unknown name until in recent decades. Uh, but her work is ex absolutely extraordinary. So that put me to a question about women artists. Uh, most of the women artists, if I could ever generalize, um, is relatively not necessarily doing much self-advocating. Uh, I, I, I mean, except a few very uh, strong voices. Um, and I, and I see in, in Vivian Meyer, in a way, of course, that's what she chose to be. But on the other hand, uh, uh, women artists and women in different areas come forward uh, one step further, step up. Um, that, to me, is also fascinating in the art world, for example, of photography, um, uh, contemporary art. Uh, Anna, your thoughts? While Jessica was talking a few minutes ago, she, I remember, of course, Virginia Woolf. And Virginia mm -hmm. Woolf said, in a way, that women uh, opens um, uh, ways to the next one and the next one because there's a woman who was able to do something, the next one can go further. Mm -hmm. And in that case, Vivian is something is a very strange case because I can talk in history of photography. Trajectory of women are very short. Yes. And um, however, they uh, contribute to settle the specificity of history of photography, their archive disappear. Right now, we have a case in Europe which is really fascinating, which is uh, Margaret Watkins. And it's the same thing. I mean, the archive disappeared during six, 60 years, and suddenly it came up to the visibility because history. Um, usually the currents of history takes the archives of women photographers, women photographers out. And in, in a way, um, I'm very glad that uh, Vivian Meyer appears um, and she, she came to stay in history of photography. She settled next to the best and most important names such as Robert Frank, Lee Friedlander and all that people. Because yeah. at that time, um, women photographer need to have a male figure, not very, not very far from them, to sustain their career. Mm. Vivian did not; she did it alone, and yes. she one of the very few uh, in history of photography. That's why it's it's a very interesting case. Mm. Jessica, women artists um, are rare in that generation. Not you know to point out the women uh, photographers like uh, and most of them like um, Diane Abbas or um, Sally Mann and uh, they don't come from wealthy families they're usually coming from at least well-off middle-class families uh -huh. because photography also not just expectations for for the um, photographers but also the, the amount of um, financial um, requirements right. to put into cameras or prints and printing them and and you know all these equipments so it really constrains i guess a lot of the women photographers um to make um consistent works and also um so uh, also the quality uh, the volumes of their work mm. are a lot less than uh, male photographers or artists at the same time right. but for how um what makes uh, Vivian Meyer is such an exceptional uh, photographer is that she took over a hundred thousand negatives and uh, um, that's just such a volume that she, she, it really means that she's been uh, taking photos every almost every day of her life incessantly mm. and uh, uh, that's just really finding her is really a shock to the world for Absolutely. sure. You know, sometimes we learn other stories, in this case, of Vivian Meyer, but we all try to find something that belongs to us, one corner or two of that story that we have echoes as well in our hearts. 
Uh, so on that note, I want to thank both of you, Anna Mohan and uh, Jessica Zhang, for putting such a wonderful exhibition, Hidden Genius of Vivian Meyer, to the viewers around the world, and this time in China. And that's our talk on Vivian Meyer, the legendary street photographer. That's all the time we have for today. If you like to see more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching and bye for now.